from a lyrical summer day in Holland. Dit sagt the land, this gentle land. Cloth white cows float by, reflected in the moss cool water that streams through this soft land where centuries pass on summer afternoons. Welcome to the latest floating poetry broadcast, and thank you for leaning in to the 105th show in my ongoing weekly series, coming to you live from the soft underfoot shores of Rhode Island, and my last broadcast for now from Shelter Harbor. The winds are carrying me elsewhere. This is your poet and poetorialist, Colin Gerdeke, a voice for living our days more poetically, more expressively, more soulfully, and let's add more gently. In broadcast 104, a theme of farewell, of saying goodbye so long, in word or heart or mind, to people, to places, to lives or ways of life or living. Adieus and auf Wiedersehens of all kinds. This week, gentleness, gentility, all things gentle, from our gestures to the weather, our words and sensitivity toward others, to dimensions of nature, nurture, and culture. Well, I found many things for us to float into, to float through together. And I thought we'd begin with some rain. This is uh, a soft afternoon rain. And let's consider as we listen in how weather can be very gentle, and that sweet feeling place of such weather, whether it's a caressing breeze or in this case a a gentle rain. This is a soft afternoon rain. Falls on the skyward face of the pond, on the immaculate feathers of the swan floating solo, larghissimo, refreshes the grasses and willows, even more greenly glowing openly weeping, fills the petite pitchers of wild flowers, bright orange between long, dry straws of reeds, moistens the petals of purple loose strife, ragweed, queenly lace, releases the bouquet of mosses, barks, and loam, brings coolness to the heat, freshness to the heart of the day, and a meditative water music to the midsummer stillness. Here's Louise Gluck's poem, A Summer Garden. Several weeks ago, I discovered a photograph of my mother sitting in the sun, her face flushed as with achievement or triumph. The sun was shining. The dogs were sleeping at her feet, where time was also sleeping, calm and unmoving as in all photographs. I wiped the dust from my mother's face. Indeed, dust covered everything. It seemed to me the persistent haze of nostalgia that protects all relics of childhood. In the background, an assortment of park furniture, trees, and shrubbery. The sun moved lower in the sky. The shadows lengthened and darkened. The more dust I removed, the more these shadows grew. Summer arrived. The children leaned over the rose border, their shadows merging with the shadows of the roses. A word came into my head, referring to the shifting and changing, these erasures that were now obvious. It appeared and has quickly vanished. Was it blindness or darkness, peril, confusion? Summer arrived, then autumn. The leaves turning, the children bright spots in a mash of bronze and sienna. 
When I had recovered somewhat from these events, I replaced the photograph as I had found it between the pages of an ancient paperback, many parts of which had been annotated in the margins, sometimes in words, but more often in spirited questions and exclamations meaning, quote, I agree, or, quote, I'm unsure, puzzled. The ink was faded. Here and there I couldn't tell what thoughts occurred to the reader, but through the bruise-like blotches I could sense urgency as though tears had fallen. I held the book a while. It was Death in Venice. In translation, I had noted the page in case, as Freud believed, nothing is an accident. Thus, the little photograph was buried again, as the past is buried in the future. In the margin, there were two words linked by an arrow, sterility, and down the page, oblivion. And it seemed to him the pale and lovely summoner out there smiled at him and beckoned. How quiet the garden is. No breeze ruffles the cornelian cherry. Summer has come. How quiet it is now that life has triumphed. The rough pillars of the sycamore support the immobile shelves of the foliage, the lawn beneath lush iridescent, and in the middle of the sky, the immodest God. Things are, he says, they are, they do not change, response does not change. How hushed it is, the stage as well as the audience. It seems breathing is an intrusion. He must be very close. The grass is shadowless. How quiet it is, how silent like an afternoon in Pompeii. Beatrice took the children to the park and Cedarhurst the sun was shining. Airplanes passed back and forth overhead, peaceful because the war was over. It was the world of her imagination. True and false were of no importance. Freshly polished and glittering, that was the world. Dust had not yet erupted on the surface of things. The planes passed back and forth, bound for Rome and Paris. You couldn't get there unless you flew over the park. Everything must pass through. Nothing can stop. The children held hands, leaning to smell the roses. They were five and seven. Infinite, infinite, that was her perception of time. She sat on a bench, somewhat hidden by oak trees. Far away, fear approached and departed. From the train station came the sound it made. The sky was pink and orange, older because the day was over. There was no wind. The summer day cast oak-shaped shadows on the green grass. Thank you, Louise Gluck. Well, I went to Wikipedia, who has this to say about gentleness. A personal quality which can be part of one's character. It consists in kindness, consideration, and amiability. Being gentle has a long history in many, but not all, cultures. It's not passive. It requires a resistance to brutality. It does not submit to tyranny but it responds with a tender awareness of others' experiences and pain. A second important usage was common in medieval times, associated with higher social classes, hence the derivation of the terms gentleman, gentlewoman, and gentry. The broadening of gentle behavior from a literal sense of that gentry to the metaphorical like a gentleman ap applicable to any person was a later development. Most recently, the late philosopher and psychoanalyst Anne Dufourmontel wrote in her book, Power of Gentleness, that it was, above all things, a force of potentiality. Gentleness, she argued, is, quote, an enigma. It is taken up in the double movement of welcoming and giving. It appears on the threshold of passages, signed off by birth and death, because it has its degree of degrees of intensity, because it is a symbolic force, and because it has a transformative ability over things and beings, it is a power. I found that very interesting. Maybe you did too. I'm curious about her book. I haven't read that. Well, part of being gentle to me, um, living gently, is how we engage with the natural world around us and with ourselves, of course. Here's an invitation to that, in a way. Kiss the earth. Kiss the earth with your feet. The sky with your eyes. The sea with your ears. Your life with your softly parted heart. Kiss the earth. And then I went to the uh, marginalian. Curious if anything might uh, turn up of interest there. And uh, Pema Chodron, the, um, the Buddhist, uh, ordained Buddhist nun, uh, contemplative, prolific author on uh, gentleness. Uh, this is from her book, The Wisdom of No Escape and the Path to Loving Kindness. It's uh, 
reflections on various aspects of how, quote, to be with oneself without embarrassment or harshness. And in there she says, if we see our so-called limitations with clarity, precision, gentleness, good-heartedness, and kindness, and having seen them fully, then let go, open further, we begin to find that our world is more vast and more refreshing and fascinating than we had realized before. The innocent mistake that keeps us caught in our own particular style of ignorance, unkindness, and shut downness is that we are never encouraged to see clearly what is with gentleness. It's seeing our emotions and thoughts just as they are right now, in this very moment, in this very room, on this very seat. It's not about trying to make them go away, not trying to become better than we are, but just seeing clearly with precision and gentleness. The honesty of precision and the good-heartedness of gentleness are qualities of making friends with yourself. Thank you, uh, Pima Chodron, for that. Well, dear listeners, I have, as I sometimes do, some questions for you, for us to ponder about gentleness. I'm curious, among other things, what some of your most gentle experiences in life have been, distant or recent, including wonderfully gentle weather. What about when someone was greatly or beautifully gentle with you, with your feelings, maybe around a charged or challenged state of being or soul-searching you were in or emerging from? Or were gentle with your body. A time when you were very gentle with another, maybe a partner, a child, or parent, or friend, and how being that gentle felt to you. And what about being gentle with your with yourself when it was most needed, or maybe it's needed right now as I speak, wherever and however you are. And uh, what do you think about modeling and encouraging more gentle relating in these over uh, polarized times of ours these often very unkind times there's plenty of kindness so we can we can find it make it but uh, i think we can also help uh, temper the other kind there's a poem by tom gunn g-u-n-n tamer and hawk I thought I was so tough, but gentled at your hands cannot be quick enough to fly for you and show that when I go, I go at your commands. Even in flight above, I am no longer free. You sealed me with your love. I am blind to other birds. The habit of your words has hooded me. As formerly, I wheel, I hover, and I twist, but only want to feel in my possessive thought of catcher and of caught upon your wrist. You but half civilize, taming me in this way. Through having only eyes for you, I fear to lose. I lose to keep and choose tamer as prey. And uh, the gentility of certain animals and other creatures like morning doves and butterflies. This is one of mine. It's called the sea turtle. He joins me in the warm and salty waters. The sea turtle, as I float, I watch him fly. See how to be graceful below the surface. Wings and chest open to the currents, feet streaming freely behind. No retracting, only expanding. Welcoming the spiritual swimming lesson from this ancient and gentle amphibian. Here's um, Eric Chalk, C-H-O-C-K. Lots of new poets tonight that I discovered. Well, new to me. And maybe to you. The baits about fly fishing. Eric Chalk. Saturday mornings, before my weekly chores, I used to sneak out of the house and across the street, grabbing the first grasshopper walking in the damp California grass along the stream. Carefully hiding a silver hook beneath its green wings, I'd float it out across the gentle ripples toward the end of its life. Just like that. I give it the hook and let it ride. All I ever expected for it was was that big mouth bass awaiting its arrival. 
I didn't think that I was giving up one life to get another, that even childhood was full of sacrifice. I'd just take the bright green thing, pluck it off its only stalk, and give it away as if it were mine to give. I knew someone out there would be fooled, that someone would accept the precious gift, so I just sent it along with a plea of a prayer, hoping it would spread its wings this time and fly across that wet glass sky. No concern for what inspired its life or mine, only instinct guiding pain toward the other side. Thank you, Eric Chalk. And how about this one by Samuel Green, Night Dive. Down here, no light but what we carry with us. Everywhere we point our hands, we scrawl color, bulging eyes, spine, teeth, or clinging tentacles. At negative buoyancy, when heavy hands seem to grasp and pull us down, we let them. We don't inflate our vests, but let the scrubbed cheeks of rock slide past an amniotic calm. At sixty feet, we douse our lights, cemented by the weight of the dark of water. The grip of the sea's absolute silence. Our groping hands brush the open mouths of anemones, which shower us in particles of phosphor radiant as halos. As in meditation or in deepest prayer, there is no knowing what we will see. Thank you, Samuel Green. Night dive. There's certainly, for me and Maybe you, a uh, gentle energy to the night stars. And I felt that so saliently one summer night on an island in the Aegean, overlooking an ancient harbor, the harbor of uh, Corisia and Caea, the Cyclades. Stars have fallen. Stars have fallen tonight, silvered down around the harbor, spilled onto the soft surrounding hillsides, where they coolly and whitely constellate, where they create a sans et lumière with the music of the wind and the waves, the gentle rustle of oak and grape leaves, until they dim and dissolve in the soon arriving light of day. Stars have fallen. Part, I feel, of the art, the practice of Gentling, we could call it, involves pausing, being at ease, sometimes quite still. And solstices and equinoxes, to me, resonate with that uh, opportunity, that sense and sensibility. This was for a winter solstice, as above and below. As the sun in gyring heavens, the ancient constellations above, Balance with the turning earth, this terra firma we call home below. Maybe, in their solstice, pausing and stilling, we can find our own place and peace of balance between them and within. Feel the deeper harmony of our being, our equally remarkable and faithful natures. Welcome this season of our life and the rhyme of our living and a sense of our next unfoldings, whatever they may be, however clear or mysterious. As we follow through all familiar and unknown bareness, darkness, the light of our own bright-gathered inner stars, spread the warmth of the truest, tenderest parts of our hearts, lean into the comforting grounding of our earthly bodies. As we wayfare out, singly and together toward more sun-long days, gentle springs, and footloose, time-soft summers. That's above and below. What kinds of people do you associate with gen gentle things, gentle people, gentle? Well, among mine are gardeners, and here's a poem for one master gardener I know and love, for Pat Morton. It's called P.S. Lady of the landscape, with your earth-made, earth-made smile. Your greenly gardened heart, sunrise eyes, blooming out from beneath the brim of your shade-giving hat. 
and your daughter at honest work by your earnest side, tending each and both to everything growing, everything inviting, gentle, caring, at your feet. And I, I know the lady of the landscape is listening tonight, so I wanted to offer that up for her. And what about uh, settings you've lived in or visited or maybe grew up in um, that you felt had a wonderfully gentle air about them, atmosphere? Well, back in September of 2016, among many other times and places, I, I had that sense of uh, spending time at my, my older brother's uh, country place in New Jersey. And I wrote this poem where the lawns are always cut I live on a street where the lawns are always cut and green, where the shingled hats and clabbered faces of the houses are all fresh, all clean, barely a neighbor to be seen, mostly just the wind and sun moving gently through the trees on this well-kept country way of daily serenity, comforting continuity. Here's a softener from uh, one of uh, the many winters I was living in New York City on Central Park West and loved walking around the reservoir there on the Upper West Side uh, daily and usually pretty memorably. A Soft Time to Walk, December 1999. Come on the walk with me here. It's a soft time of day to walk around the water, a time when the ducks are resting their snow-white breasts like low clouds, and the December light transmutes the bricks and stones of the buildings to gold. It's a soft time of day to walk when the mild air is musky with moist earth and lovely leaves have fallen from the gowns of disrobing trees that ring the reservoir, a bowl of blue lake reflecting autumn under glass. It's a soft time to walk when all goes pink, even the seashell shape museum, and the lamplights wink on like a train of tethered fireflies, and the sun sinks to rest in a big oblong bath of cantaloupe colored sky. You might agree there's something to be said for young children, their softness of being, yes quite some time in their early years. You, you would remember that, uh, watching them, but also being one. And uh, those who also teach the very young, I find they, they have a certain gentle character often, in my experience. Well, I had this uh, um, experience of, of, uh, of gentleness and children at the Brooklyn uh, Academy of Music at BAM in 2004. It was watching a scene from a... Uh, a Pina Bausch dance performance, and it was sort of, I guess there were scenes, uh, we could call them, and this was a scene uh, where this one a character came out uh, playing a cloud, and there were lots of children on the stage, and it, uh, I entitled this poem, Fille de Kinder, for the children. A blonde-headed, two-legged cloud with a large tin watering can, blown barefoot about by a gentle mouth, Roses rain down there and there with a bending arm, and a few puffs later floats quietly off stage. Phil de Kindel. I um, I was looking at a couple of uh, sort of whimsical things. I was thinking of the story of Ferdinand the Bull. I'm not going to pass on that, but you may know about that story. He was right. The gentle bull just wanted to smell the flowers, even when he went to the bullfight. It didn't. He just couldn't muster himself to do that. He was, went back to his field and flowers. But I, I like this poem I came across by uh, uh, Mona Van Doyen, um, The Gentle Snorer. When summer came, we locked up our lives and fled to the woods in Maine and pulled up over our heads a comforter filled with bats of piney dark, tied with crickets, chiridings, and the bork of frogs, we hid in a sleep of strangeness from the human humdrum. 
a pleasant noise with the unordered world makes wove around us. Burrowed, we heard the scud of waves, rack of bending branch, or plop of a fish on his heavy helm. The little beasts rummaged the brush. We dimmed to silence, slipped from the angry pole of wishes and will. And then we had a three weeks cabin guest who snored. He broke the otherness of our rest. As all night long he sipped the succulent air, that rhythm we shared made visible to the ear a rich refreshment of the blood. We fed in unison with him. A sound we dreamed and woke to over the snuff of wind, not loud enough to scare off the roof, the early morning chipmunks, under our skins we heard, as after disease, the bright, thin tick of our time. Sleeping, he mentioned death and celebrated breath. He went back home. The water flapped the shore. A thousand bugs drilled at the darkness. Over the lake a loon howled. Nothing spoke up for us, salvagers always of what we have always lost. And we thought that what the night needed was more of man. He left us so partisan. Thank you. Thank you, Mona Van I, I enjoyed that. Hope you enjoyed that. Here's, um, here's a poem um, when I was thinking for us about um, keep reaching um, to the gentlest parts of others, and especially if we have partners, and especially when things become difficult. This is a short poem by Dan Gerber. Uh, marriage. When you are angry, it's your gentle self I love until that's who you are. In any case, I can't love this anger any more than I can warm my heart with ice. I go on loving your smile till it finds its way back to your face. Thank you, Dan Gerber. Love is surely a place where gentleness can be, um, can flower, flow, be expressed, be greatly felt and embodied. This is Paul Carroll's poem, Valentine. Our matchbox bedroom in the loft above your sculpture factory turns magical at times behind its dark blue druid door. Last night, inside you, sweetheart, it felt as if I were coming from the soul itself. And that Indian summer Sunday afternoon a year ago when the bed became a meadow of purple thistles, the honey hidden at the bottom of the stem, farm kids know how to find for the sweetest suck of all. And sometimes in the winter, when the room turns into a Cornell box filled with the everyday miracles, soap bubble, pipe and thimble, wooden rabbits, and old tan magazine illustrations of the Zodiac, or turns into an igloo in which the only place to go is to burrow here below the yellow blanket and the pillows to the South Pacific of ourselves. And then those mornings on vacation, gentle as the feathers of a light spring rain, and at the same time hard like the beak of a hawk, you are where I belong. Thank you, Paul Carroll. Well, I have one. Uh, I've read it uh, on a couple of other occasions for different reasons, but uh, maybe uh, I could share it with you again here. It's called A Midsummer's Nightgown. I feel it's brimming with loveliness and gentleness and a great place of reverie when, when all uh, goes calm and soft inside and around us, yes, when we're in reveries. As I dusk dream in the evening breeze, eyes half open to the outstretched water, under high green canopies that silk song with leaves and robin's wings and cicadas that fade up and out at the edges of my ears, I imagine you appear, moving gently, midsummerly here, move toward me through the clovered glade in a gown of glowing fireflies, their dreamlight draping your bare shoulders, floating over your long arms, lighting your irises, lamping the widening night around you with a deep enchantment. I came across a couple of other thoughts on uh, gentleness. I'll give you two of them. Uh, it means recognizing that the world around us is fragile, especially other people. 
recognizing our own capacity to do harm and choosing instead to be tender, soft-spoken, soft-hearted, and careful. When we're gentle, we touch the world in ways that protect and preserve it. It doesn't mean being weak can be firm, even powerful. To behave in a gentle manner requires that we stay centered in our own values and strength, that we are active rather than reactive. Coming from the center, a gentle word or touch can channel our energy into healing or making peace. It actually uh, sparked me to remember my marvelous uh, father-in-law or father-in-love, as I called him, Leonardo, and he would often say a, a kind word and a smile goes a long way, much longer than you can imagine. And uh, it's uncultivating gentleness. Everyone wants to be near a gentle stream, a gentle person, a gentle pet. If I think of hard times I've been through, it is gentleness I've always wanted. Not people-pleasing, sappy sweetness, but honest, heartfelt gentleness. To be hugged, to have someone hold my hand, or to care about me, even for a minute, with caring gentleness. This is what the heart seeks. I also came across an article by Andy Mort, Andy Mort, M-O-R-T dot com. Um, the Seven Habits of Highly Gentle People. He's a slow coach, quote, slow coach for gentle rebels. How about that for a, a line? And uh, he, he says gentleness breeds peace, calm, and consistency of character. It's not volatile or abrupt in its response to the world. Uh, I've become to believe that acting with gentleness is an act of rebellion. It stands counter to the expectations of a quick-tempered, blame-fueled culture where we want to take our frustrations out by criticizing others, shirking responsibility, and fearing and fighting anyone or any way of life that we don't understand or subscribe to. So he, he talks about how can we develop strength in, founded in gentleness, and I just will just go to his number three, which is allow yourself to care. Um, simply acknowledging and allowing yourself to care about things, other people, the world, your hopes and dreams. It's so easy to become disenfranchised and switch off your heart. Certain situations can quickly feel hopeless, pointless, and futile if we allow them. Our experiences can lead us to become disinterested. But we can become ever more gentle, my friends. If we're not already, it can always be more, I think. It's a poem I... Uh, wrote for my goddaughter, Axel, uh, on her 23rd birthday a while back, but I, I feel it applies to many of us, maybe all of us. It's called What Shapes You. As you live your life, year by year, season by season, day by day by starborn night, forms and fashions, sculpts and stipples you. There's the nature of the landscapes and cultures you move and deep breathe through. The weather of elements, relationships, calms and storms of the heart you're exposed to. The workings and playings of your mind, your dreams. The transits of the planets, the music of the natural world. All shaping and reshaping you, slightly too finely, gently too greatly. As you live and love through every part of your beautifully pliant life. What shapes you? So that um, that relationship of kindness to gentleness. Uh, Naomi, uh, she had Nye's poem, Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go. So you know how desolate the landscape landscape can be between the regions of kindness, how you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. 
Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore, only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread, only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, It is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. Thank you, uh, Naomi Shihab Thai, for that. Well, I thought uh, wistfully about true gents I uh, knew firsthand or heard stories about. And I have a few in poem form uh, I wanted to share. And the first is uh, about uh, Billy Bryan, amazing Southern gentleman uh, in all senses who I knew. Was, and this was uh, after his passing. This was sent uh, for him, made for him, but also given to his beautiful family. Flying South. You're flying south now farther south than you ever dreamed of going, traveling australly and astrally at the speed of infinite bliss, far beyond time and a century of earthly delights, from a young fellow dallying and dancing to a gentle man husbanding and fathering, to a wise figure doctoring and postdoctorally granddaddying, riding throughout a tide of graciousness and gregariousness that made you a small giant and gave you a glow of famousness in the hearts of friends and family who see you flying now into the arms of the universe and taking as you go a turn through the crab nebula for the sentimental part of your journey, a sweet sip from the Milky Way, and a hat off to the heavenly ladies from Virgo to Cassiopeia, to your great and guiding southern star, and to the sun that will shine on your face forever. Flying south. Cecil Hemley's poem, Two Gentle Women. With their mysterious clatter in their pale robes, seeing the sunset spatter in the garden flowers that fold, and at the gate coming up in their gray tweeds, their men from the trains, as sure as the evening, with the children's laugh and the dog's ears bending, catching a distant sound, in their world fragile as china chintz the lace in their curtains dreaming of fountains evoked by hands hitting the sevenths and knowing tragedy as the woman who dies in the eighteenth chapter with blood a remembrance of the time their fingers were pricked in the fall of the nations distant across the sea where the armies have been when the houses crumble and the street men whirl rioting the dark cities and the caesars ride then will the gentle women rise from their chairs and walk into the silence where marie of austria sleeps Thank you, Cecil, uh, Emily, Alan uh, Bosquet, an old gentleman. I am an old gentleman who, in his bath, knows what the world, that the world is gradually slipping away from him. He washes, pinches himself, not caring if it's raining outside or if the sky comes in through the window to converse briefly with him. He wonders what his shoulder is for. He loses his mind bit by bit, certain that his soul will soon no longer function. Water strokes him. The sentry still has a sweet smell. I am an old gentleman, a towel around his neck, who, looking for his glasses, has lost his life deep within the mirror. Thank you, Alan Bosquet. Well, I call us each and all to gentleness, um, I've been doing that, I think, in certain ways here and uh, in, in my my day-to-days out in the world. Come sit by the lily pond. Come sit by the lily pond. Quietly compose yourself in cool serenity. Let your thoughts drift here like blossoms on the water's calm surface. Let's feel into the places in nature where you felt uh, sweetly held by it, beautifully, gently, calmly, kindly, or when you do ahead in time. This is uh, on a deep green rise. You hike with long legs up to a deep green rise, shirt unbuttoned to the sun, sleeves rolled and stopped to drink in the serene blue lake, bathe in the lather of the country clouds, Long, soft, 
gentle clouds, their undersides still warm from the day. You lie down, face, chest, palms to the sky. Let all the elements converge. Amy Lowell's poem, Spring Day, Bath. The day is fresh washed and fair, and there is a smell of tulips and narcissus in the air. The sunshine pours in at the bathroom window and bores through the water in the bathtub in lathes and planes of greenish white. It cleaves the water into, into flaws like a jewel and cracks it to bright light. Little spots of sunshine lie on the surface of the water and dance, dance, and their reflections wobble deliciously over the ceiling. A stir of my finger sets them whirring, reeling. I move a foot, and the planes of light in the water jar. I lie back and laugh and let the green-white water, the sun-flawed barrel water, flow over me. The day is almost too bright to bear. The green water covers me from the too bright day. I will lie here a while and play with the water and the sunspots. The sky is blue and high. A crow flaps by the window, and there is a whiff of tulips and narcissus in the air. Thank you, Amy. What if we become more gentle by letting go of the stressful and entering the peaceful, the restful? This is called Leave the Calendar Behind on the Autumnal Equinox of 2019. Let the pages loose to fly off in the first autumn breeze. Instead of reading what day, month, season of the year it is, step outside. Feel into the air, the changing light, the landscape before you, around you. Let them tell you where things are. Like the equinox now balancing in, balancing in as you attend. Let your body pivot naturally and your thoughts glide gently away from fleeting summer toward fanfaring fall. Witness everything cooling down, everything spooling out in clear light, in soon-to-come pageant colors, fragrant scents, abundant textures. Accept the invitation to rise with, like the evening star. Take the offered hand of nature and enter together into its widely alive and enlivening theater. Jane Hirschfield's poem, Tree. It is foolish to let a young redwood grow next to a house, even in this one lifetime. You will have to choose. That great calm being, this clutter of soup pots and books, already the first branch tips brush at the window. Softly, calmly, immensity taps at your life. Thank you, Jane uh, Hirschfield, for that. And here's uh, Jeffrey Brock's poem, The Day. It hangs on its stem like a plum at the edge of a darkening thicket, it's swelling and blushing and ripe, and I reach out a hand to pick it, but flesh moves slow through time, and evening comes on fast, and just when I think my fingers might seize that sweetness at last, the gentlest of breezes rises, and the plum lets go of the stem, and now it's my fingers ripening and evening that's reaching for them. Thank you, Jeffrey Brock. And uh, let's return once more to the weather, uh, the wonderfully softening effects it can have on us, on our bodies, our spirits. Early summer morning after rain, New York City, stepping into the city after a night long rain onto cool, wet cobblestones, into full, floating scents of moist earth, thriving green leaves, the lime musk of sycamore bark, the pale perfume of a run-wild rose bush, into quietly inviting feelings of freshness, lushness, everything washed down, washed clean, every planting overspilling, past puddles in the walking path, all clear and still, like the reservoir I circle softly round but for the ripple of a bell from an old church tower ringing the morning hour across the water. Langston Hughes, April Rain Song. Let the rain kiss you. 
Let the rain beat upon your head with silver liquid drops. Let the rain sing you a lullaby. The rain makes still pools on the sidewalk. The rain makes running pools in the gutter. The rain plays a little sleep song on our roof at night, and I love the rain. Thank you, Langston Hughes. We're coming down to our last sharings for now. August Morning by Albert Garcia. It's ripe, the melon by our sink, yellow, bee-bitten, soft. It perfumes the house too sweetly. At five I wake, the air mournful in its quiet. My wife's eyes swim calmly under their lids, her mouth and jaw relaxed, different. What is happening in the silence of this house? Curtains hang heavily from their rods. Ficus leaves tremble at my footsteps, yet the colors outside are perfect. Orange geranium, blue lobelia. I wander from room to room, like a man in a museum. Wife, children, books, flowers, melon, such still air. Soon the mid-morning breeze will float in like tepid water, then hot. How do I start this day? I, who am unsure of how my life has happened or how to proceed amid this warm and steady sweetness. Thank you, Albert Garcia. Next to last, um, another uh, Equinox poem, uh, serenely centered. You're floating straight up above a field or an ocean, a forest or mountain. Your limbs are loose. Your gaze is soft. A warm breeze plays on your skin. Centered over your head is a great sun. Below your soul is a great moon. The three of you floating together, balanced weightlessly, cradled gently in space in the open sky. Your three bodies, a trinity of light and lightness, serenely centered with the earth, the fertile earth, your home, your breathing and birthing place being and becoming place that turns itself now slowly, now surely again to, to flower at your feet. Let us stay serenely centered, shall we, as we can. And last for now, a call to gentleness of all kinds, inside and from us and toward us and around us. This is how beauty continues. While countries, armies, and ideologies battle, bees make honey, butterflies float and drink the nectar from gently open flowers. While spouses, neighbors, bosses, and workers quarrel, the sun still sets and rises, brings color, splendor, to snow-hatted mountains, old-growth forests, bird-filled meadows, the moon still shines upon the faces of oceans and lakes, fjords and flowing rivers. On fish-filled bays, clear streams and tarns, tide pools of mussels, anemones, sea stars. While attention's actions turn to ungraced choices and places of being, unlovely behaving in the world's towns and villages, houses and metropolises, beauty everywhere, ever here, ever pure, continues. Thank you again very much for leaning in, floating in, and gentling in, and for your appreciations of all kinds, like Hugh from Long Beach, who, whose summation for show 104 on farewells and goodbyes was phenomenal, or Preston out in Boulder, Colorado, on hearing the poem for my soul brother, Brad Hammer, who happens to be his blood brother, said, OMG. If you'd like to offer a, a kudo or comment or a question about this or another broadcast, I'd be glad to have it. My email is colin at thepoetorialist.com. And if you want to express your thanks with a contribution, by all means, as they help me keep going with these weekly shows. 
You can contribute by Venmo to fivefold, F-I-V-E-F-O-L-D, at pipeline.com, or by PayPal, or directly through my site, thepoetorialist.com, and the Donate tab. Or simply by mail to me at P.O. Box 1032, Westerly, Rhode Island, 02891. Any patrons desiring to host me as a working artist, a poet in residence, on a given property, for a given time, late spring, or summer, or fall, to create a new flight of poetic art and dedicate it to you, kindly reach out and we'll discuss the possibilities. I also welcome invitations to be a virtual artist in residence, a poetic presence for an online community. Meanwhile, you can hear all the broadcasts online, on YouTube, on the Floating Poetry playlist. I hope you'll lean in soon again. Until then, dear listeners, fellow explorers and evolvers, Here's to finding and appreciating all places, feelings, and experiences of gentleness and bringing a more gentle tending to your own self and to others, especially the world of challenged people, friends and strangers alike, and to nature, all seeking balance and calmness, kind-heartedness around you. Goodbye for now, and good spirits.